really the purpose of our gathering tonight uh, at first Wednesday is that we can listen to God's word, that we can open up God's word, uh, that those of us who, who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ can grow uh, in our Christian faith and that those of us uh, who are still uh, exploring uh, coming to that place, uh, perhaps coming to that place of faith with an opportunity uh, to respond. Let me give you the greetings of Calderwood Baptist Church. That's the, the church that I've been in for the last 20 years. Uh, it's the church where Stan preaches uh, the third Sunday uh, of every month. Uh, he's with us. We love uh, Stan and Anne-Marie. We love having them with us uh, at Calderwood. and uh, We really appreciate uh, their ministry. And of course, we've been great supporters uh, of First Wednesday right from the, the outset. Uh, all those uh, years back so it is good I feel as if we're always David's with me uh, this time and I feel every time we we're down here we're just amongst friends we're just amongst family uh, which is a joy so let's uh, let's as family uh, open up God's word we're going to uh, read Acts chapter 4 uh, verse 23 through the 31 I'll read that passage of scripture and then I'm just going to pray uh, briefly uh, and then we'll begin to unpack uh, that portion of scripture uh, this evening. Acts chapter 4, this is the word of the Lord. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is powerful to the salvation of souls to the transforming of lives, to the making and shaping and transforming of people ever increasingly into the likeness of the Lord Jesus himself. And we pray, Lord our God, that as we uh, open up your word this evening together, that we would sense your presence and that you would speak to us Speak in ways that we might listen, that we might hear, that we might respond to all that you are saying for your glory. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, look uh, at Acts chapter 4, this little passage which I've just read. And just to give us a little bit of the context, it, it begins there in verse 23 by saying, When they were released. And of course it raises a question right away, uh, who is this uh, and why have they just been released and what have they just been released from? Uh, and to do that we've got to kind of look back uh, a little bit uh, in Acts and in Acts chapter 3 
uh, we discover uh, that uh, Peter uh, and John, uh, followers of Christ, have uh, just uh, been used of God for his glory uh, in the, 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 the raising uh, up, uh, you know, the man uh, who was crippled and who was uh, begging uh, at the temple gate. And then after that, uh, Peter goes into Solomon's portico and he begins to preach the word of God. Uh, and everyone who is there is listening to him. And the Jewish religious leaders uh, who under the plan and purpose of God had actually crucified Christ are there. And so we, we pick up in Acts chapter 3 verse 17 these words Peter is preaching. He says, and now brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. Whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke. By the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. That was the message that Peter had preached. He preached a message largely to Jewish hearers about how the promises that God had made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were all pointing toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Of how the death of Jesus Christ was no accident. But in actual fact the design of God. For the salvation of all who would believe. And that kind of preaching gets you into trouble. <laughs> That's what happens uh, in that day and age. And in actual fact it still happens in today's day and age. You know it doesn't happen too much to us uh, here in the UK. But it does happen to uh, those who are followers of Christ. In many countries where persecution still rages. Uh, just two weeks ago uh, I was with a, a beautiful brother in Christ. I met him in Poland. He does not minister in Poland. Uh, he ministers uh, in another European country. A European country uh, that is very supportive of an ongoing communist regime. And a European country uh, that still persecutes those who preach. And I'm with this brother and this is what he said to me. He said, John, before I became a Christian, I was a very quiet, law-abiding citizen. He says, but in my country, he says, the government is set against the word of God and the message of God's salvation and his plan that by repentance and faith in Christ, all of us can know God, love God, and live as God intends. He said, and I can tell you, he said that before I became a Christian, I was never in bother with the law. But since I've become a Christian, I've been in prison three times. I've been in prison three times because I'm convinced about God's message of salvation. That the only way anyone can know forgiveness of sin. The only way anyone can know what it is to be restored to God. The only way that anyone can be put in a right standing with God is by repentance of their godless life and surrender to all that Jesus Christ has done on the cross. And I had the privilege uh, of, uh, of that brother uh, kneeling on the floor beside a number of us who just placed their hands on him and prayed that God would give him boldness to go on declaring the message of Jesus 
even though for him, by simply preaching what I would preach, or Stan would preach, or any other preacher, Rob would preach, uh, that he would have a boldness that by holding out the words of life in Jesus Christ, that he'd have a boldness, even although it could cost him imprisonment. And when we look at this passage, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at Peter and John in prison. They're going to be facing some, you know, sort of trumped up court, the same trumped up court that natural fact crucified Christ. That's what they're going to be facing. Uh, and, you know, there they are. Uh, and, and it's because they've been preaching God's word. Because they've been holding out the saving message uh, of the gospel. That kind of preaching gets you into trouble. And so they appear uh, before the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees. Uh, and they're, look what it says, verse 2. They're greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Isn't it incredible that people can get so annoyed at the person of Jesus Christ? Isn't it incredible that people uh, can get so annoyed and angry... Uh, by the message of hope, by the message of life that there is in the death of Jesus Christ which cancels out sin and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that assures us that this life is not all there is. And the Lord Jesus Christ said it himself, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And here are these uh, bold uh, disciples of Christ, followers of Christ, uh, you know, who have been proclaiming that. I want you to notice what actually happens as they hold out that message of life. It says in verse 3, And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to about 5,000. You see, nothing can stop a sovereign God from accomplishing his plan and purpose. He's now one of nothing. Absolutely nothing can stop the sovereign God from accomplishing all that he has planned to do. And, and when God speaks to us of his love in Christ, when Scott, God speaks to us about the hope that is in Christ, when God convicts us of our sin and our shortcomings and asks us, invites us to put our trust in Christ, nothing can stop that. And so the reality is that as he's preaching this message, up to 5,000 men, in all probability, there's others there as well, have come to faith in Christ. And so this, uh, you know, religious court that had crucified Christ start to interrogate uh, Peter and John. And uh, the interrogation uh, basically resulted in them saying to Peter and John, we're going to release you, but you have to stop preaching. We're going to release you, but you have to stop talking about Jesus. We're going to release you, but you have to stop telling others the good news of God's love for us and the fact that we can know God and be right with God. And Peter and John, it says there, when they were released, they go to their friends and they report what the chief priests and elders had said to them. Now, don't get me wrong, my friends, the threat was very real. Right? This was the same people that had crucified Christ. And when they released them, they actually turned around and it says they released them with many other threats and warnings. So they were serious as a heartbeat about, you know, the, the accusation they were making. Stop talking about Jesus. Well, what do you do when the sort of tide of society, uh, as was the case for them and is very often the case for ourselves, uh, and even uh, as we think about our dear brother Paul tonight, when the tide of society is kind of, you know, saying we don't want to be obedient to God's word. We don't want to follow what God says. We don't want to live in a way that honours God. What do you do? The first thing you do is you gather together with like-minded brothers and sisters in Christ. And you pray. You cry out to God and you pray. And what they did was incredible. Because when they got together, uh, they cried out, Sovereign Lord. And I want you to think a little bit tonight about that. Sovereign Lord. What a way to pray. To acknowledge that God is God. You know, that, that's the basis of anyone coming to faith in Christ. You've got to first acknowledge, I am not God, He is. You know, I cannot save myself, only He can save me. You know, I, I, I am not the king that I think I am. In actual fact, you know, in a world of expressive individualism, the hardest thing is for people to die to pride and say, I need God. I need the Saviour. 
And so they knew that and they cry out to God. They say, Sovereign Lord. And I want you to notice there's a few things about Sovereign God tonight that I hope will either encourage your heart or else would just touch your heart to say, I can trust a God like this. He turned around and he says, Sovereign Lord, uh, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You see, there's people who understand that this world is not here by accident. This, this world did not just happen by chance. That there's a creator, there's a designer, that everything's got a plan and a purpose. And that it's all working out uh, according to God's eternal plan. And so he says, Sovereign Lord, the maker of heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that's in them. You know, we're here tonight in a mathematics room, right? And you know what staggers me? You know, when you look at the wonder of the design of creation, it staggers me that people can look at it and say, it's not got a creator. It just happened by chance. I just find that mind numbing. I find it mind numbing that sort of intellectuals and academics will adopt a position that can just remove God out of the equation and, you know, and fail to see that there's a God who is behind all of that. You know, Lord of the heavens, Lord of the earth, Lord of the sea, and he's Lord of the entire universe. He's over and above it all. The scripture says that God holds the mountains in his hands. We stand before an Everest thinking, wow, God holds it in a hand. You know, uh, he's vast, he's majestic. Now you and I, we need a vision of God. We need a vision of God of just who he is. Because the vision that we have of God is the vision that will sustain us when at times the need overwhelms us. And so the reality is they've got this incredible vision and they're entering into the presence of God and they're saying, you're the one who made the heavens, the earth and the sea. This looks big, this looks serious, but to you, Lord, this is as nothing. This is as nothing. And sometimes we can be overwhelmed by all the small details of life. Lord of the heaven, Lord of the earth, Lord of the sea. The other day, uh, I was preaching down in Ayrshire uh, in Scotland. It's a beautiful part of the world. And I was in Dumfries House. Some of you might know Dumfries House. King Charles, uh, in actual fact, took over Dumfries House and uh, you know, did an incredible job uh, of, of renewing it and revitalising it. And the grounds are stunning. And I'm walking through the grounds. Uh, and I'm, you know, everything about the place, the scale of the trees, the variety of the wildlife, the plant life, the fragrances, the wonder, the beauty. And I'm sitting there thinking, there is a God. There is a God that mankind needs to bow before. There is a God that mankind needs to acknowledge. But hallelujah, he's a God who makes himself known. And so the reality is I'm going round all that and it's incredible. It's stunning. Right? Sometimes I sit there with my grandchildren watching, uh, you know that, that, that uh, one that's on the television, and again it's, you know, generally speaking atheists that sort of do the filming in bits and pieces, but you're under the sea, and you're seeing the most incredible, you know, animal life that's under there, you know, fish that you've got to go so deep to actually see, and you're sitting there thinking, God the designer, you know, God the creator, the sovereign Lord of the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything that's in them. And they turn around, uh, and, and when they pray, they don't just pray Sovereign Lord of all creation. They pray Sovereign Lord over the nations. That's what they pray. Because they turn around and they quote Psalm 2. Psalm 2, King David, uh, Israel's greatest king. Uh, you know, why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointing. He's the Sovereign God over the nations. And so when I get the privilege to travel to different you know, parts of the world and I'm with this dear brother, I'm just protecting him and not naming the country, uh, I'm with this dear brother uh, and, and he's been arrested several times as a political prisoner for preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Right? <laughs> Tells you something about the insecurity of humanity, doesn't it? When they think the good news of Jesus Christ means a person should be persecuted and imprisoned as a political prisoner. But at the end of the day, there's a sovereign God that people don't want to acknowledge. And that can be true of us, even if we don't live in those countries. And the reality is, I've got the privilege, uh, and you're able to pray 
Our God is God over all the nations. Even those that don't acknowledge him. Even those at the present moment in time stand at the pride of man and think they're more significant than him. He's sovereign Lord over all the nations. And history itself shows uh, God of the nations. Uh, sovereign God. I had the privilege again of uh, you know, working with some folks. You know, we look at the Western church and we see the decline, the demise of a lot of churches that are largely apostate. But I had the privilege of being with the uh, believers from the church in Asia. And the rate at which the church is growing as people come under a conviction of sin and die to pride and die to self and acknowledge that God is God and make him their saviour. And the church is exploding uh, right across Asia. Uh, at the present moment in time. Sovereign God of the nations. And they pray to this Lord of creation. This Lord of the nations. And here's the beautiful thing. This Lord of salvation history. Because in verse 27. He says truly in this city. They were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. Whom you anointed. Herod. Pontius Pilate. Gentiles. Peoples of Israel. To do. Read this little bit. Whatever your hand. And your plan had predestined to take place. He's the sovereign Lord of salvation. This is the beauty of, of, of the God that we worship. Of the God that we can know through Jesus Christ. He's the Lord of salvation. The sovereign Lord of salvation. And so even at the time when Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentile peoples. And the people of Israel were crying out for the crucifixion of Christ. This is all according to a sovereign God's plan. Jesus does not ba die by accident. Jesus does not die on Calvary's cross uh, because those who were against him have won. Jesus dies on Calvary's cross because God knows the only way you and I can actually be forgiven and set free and put in a right relationship with him is if Jesus, the sinless Son of man, the perfect sacrificial lamb, takes upon himself your sin and my sin. It's all according to God's perfect plan. He's the sovereign Lord of all history. And down through uh, the history of mankind, the message of Jesus Christ has been held out. And people have been invited to repent and put their trust in Christ and to follow him with all that they are. And you know what I love? As they think about the, God, the sovereign God in that way, they actually realize that he's the sovereign Lord of their circumstances and of their situation right now. That's what that does for them. Praying in that way helps them to realise that he's the sovereign Lord of their circumstances, of their situation, right in that moment. Now look at their moment. Their moment is they've been preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Their moment is that they've been arrested for that. They've been let go for that, warned that if they continue to preach the good news of Jesus, they'll be back in prison and much worse can happen to them. But when they look at the sovereign God of creation, and when they look at the sovereign God of the nations, and when they look at the sovereign God of history, they realise that the same sovereign God is God in their moment. And I would say the same sovereign God is God in our moment. Right now. In our day, in our age. And so their prayer is a beautiful one. Because they say, And now, Lord, look upon their threats, and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Isn't that stunning? They actually turn around and pray, you're the God of all this. So what we want to do is we want you... To look upon their threats and we want us to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you. You see what happens when, when, when a person preaches the word of God? What happens when a person shares the gospel of Jesus Christ? 
All that I can do, all that you can do if you're a believer in Christ and you share the good news of the gospel with someone else is sow the seed of the word of God into a person's heart and life. It's all we can do, right? We can only sow the seed of God's word. But God can take the seed which is sown and he can bring about the miracle of salvation in a person's heart. He can bring about the miracle of faith in a person's heart. He can grant the conviction that leads to repentance, that leads to trust, that leads to following Christ. Jim Packer said it long ago, that evangelism is man's work, but the giving of faith is God's. And so what they say is they pray in a perfect way. They say, Lord, they're threatening us, but you're Lord, you're sovereign Lord of this moment. So would you give us boldness just to keep sharing the good news of Jesus? Would you give us boldness to keep holding out the words of life? You know, that's a prayer that the Christian church needs today. The Christian church needs a prayer for boldness to keep holding out the words of life amidst the society that does not want to hear the words of life. And the reality is they turn around and they say, we can do that because of sovereign God. And what do you do when you sow the seed of the word of God in a person's life? When you sow the seed of the word of God in a person's life, God is the one who is able to open the eyes that a person might believe, that a person might have faith. That a person might put their trust in Christ. So when I say earlier on. Uh, you know about the sovereign Lord. Uh, over death. And I say I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes not in me but in Jesus. Even though they die yet shall they live. It is an eternal truth of God. I can sow the seed of that word. I sat with a, a, a man who was dying of cancer. Uh, a little while back. Uh, we had planned to actually read John's Gospel together, but his cancer accelerated. Uh, and I went to see him, realising that I was never going to have the opportunity uh, to read through John's Gospel with him. And so what did I do? I read with him John 11. Uh, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. I read with him that incredible claim. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. As I read that with him, a dying man, he could see the promise of Jesus was there just to be taken, to be trusted, to confess sin, to trust Christ. He was never going to be able to get baptised and become a member of our church. He was never going to be able to, you know, sort of join in with some of the things we do in the life of the church. Life was short. But there was opportunity because of the promise of God's word. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's an eternal truth. And again, what we've got to do is we've got to begin where people are and hold out the eternal truths of scripture. Sow the seed of God's word into a person's life. And God can open the eyes. God can open the eyes that they can not only hear, but they can hear and believe they can hear and trust they can hear and put all their faith not in the preacher but in the promises of God's word and that's what we long for uh, in our day and in our age it's why we do uh, what we do and so the great thing about this is the prayer is so right because they say Lord you give us boldness but you do incredible things Every time a person believes in Christ, it truly is a miracle of God's grace. He says, well, you stretch out your hands to heal. Well, you uh, do signs and wonders that are performed through your holy servant, Jesus. The greatest miracle in anyone's life is to actually understand and believe and put all their trust in Christ. That's the greatest miracle there is. And so the reality is uh, that the, the prayer is so right. You know, give us boldness and you do great things. I was uh, spending a little bit of time uh, with uh, a young man who's doing incredible work uh, in, in some of the hardest and toughest places in Central Europe. He's a young man uh, that is really in pouring his life out, him and his wife and young children, pouring his life out into the under 30s. 50% of the population of Europe is under 30. 50% of the population of Europe which is under 30 will never cross the door for the most part of a church. And so what he's done is he's taken the Great Commission literally and he's going out into uh, the places where many of those folks are. 
Uh, and we were talking about it. I said, you know, whenever I uh, go into any context, think of the Great Commission, whenever I go into any context, I want to try and understand uh, the starting place for where they are. And he said, John, he says, you're so right. He said, I talk about the seven lies of our society. And as he talked about these seven lies of our society amongst the under 30s, I said to him, you know, look, my friend, that's not just lies of the under 30s. I says, that's lies of the over 30s. That's lies of, of people uh, of our age uh, and stage in life. Here were the seven lies that he was uh, asking God for boldness uh, to speak the gospel into that people uh, might come to Christ and believe. He said, lie number one, we can only be sure of what we see. We live in a world that's bought that lie. In actual fact, the truth of God's word is, uh, it, it actually declares that blessed are you who believe even without seeing tangibly the physical resurrected Christ. But in actual fact, we live in a world that is bought into the lie. We can only be sure of what we see. Lie number two, we're all here by accident. You know, you walk into most educational establishments at the present moment in time, and all you will hear is that we're all here by accident. This is just one great big accident. And it's a lie of the devil. It's a lie of the very pit of hell itself. Because there is a sovereign Lord over all of this. And yet society buys the lie. Here's the third one. And I find this one so true. Uh, not just for the under 30s. But of the, the over 30s. Everything is going to be okay. Is that not a lie that so many people have bought? Everything is going to be okay. You know. I, you know I'm undecided about God. You know and the question. It's funny you know when I'm mathematics room. To the question is there a God. The answer is either yes or no. It is not maybe. Right. You know, so if we sit there, for, everything's going to be okay. Right? And the funny thing is, people sit in the fence, it's the, it's the agnostic point of view, isn't it? I'm undecided about that person of Jesus, who I find quite, you know, revolutionary and quite awkward, right? It's that question, we sit in the fence. Uh, but to the question of God, either he is or he isn't. And for me, all the evidence of this world in which we live points toward the existence of a sovereign God to whom we are all accountable. Uh, and yet people turn around and even although they ever worship him, even although uh, they have not confessed their sin and put their trust in him, even although they're far from him in their daily life, they kind of think everything will be okay in the end, won't it? Sometimes it's asked with a little doubt, you know, everything will be okay, won't it? Well, the truth of that is everything can be okay if we believe God's message of salvation. Everything can be okay if we trust Jesus. Everything can be okay and it all depends on what we do with Jesus. But it's a lie that, that many people buy into. Here's the fourth lie. I can be whoever I want to be. You know, that, that's a lie that's so, so you know, prominent uh, you know, amongst the, the, you know, the young culture at the present moment in time. Uh, it's a lie that's been fed uh, by legislation and by you know, misinformed. Uh, politicians uh, you know we, we can understand that people can have an identity crisis and struggle to know who they are all of us have that we only find out who we really are when we put our trust in Christ we can understand all that but people can actually take that and make that their religion you know I can be whoever I want to be self is king expressive individualism at its best and it's a lie of our society five it doesn't matter what you believe. I hear that all the time. It doesn't matter what you believe, you know. Uh, surely all of it is just this big search to God and somehow or other. Well, the reality is it's not all the big search for God. God can be known. But God lays out his terms. And his terms are, you've got to repent of your pride and your fallenness and your waywardness. And you've got to put your trust in the sacrifice of Christ. And so the reality is that, you know, we, we live in a world that's plagued by those lies. Six, love is just a passing feeling. And that's why we've got the multiplicity of relationships. And that's why we've got relational breakdown. Because I can fall in love, I can fall out of love. And it's just a passing feeling. And yet the reality is, uh, the scriptures actually declare God is love. 
And if you want to know anything of what love is, it begins and ends with God. And here's the great thing, it begins and is unending with God. Because that's the God of love. <laughs> but we, we, we're born into so many of the lies of society uh, that it's sometimes difficult to break free uh, of those things. And here's the seventh one. Uh, to find, uh, what's this one now? Uh, to find God, you have to be religious. <laughs> You know, I, I, and it's so true, isn't it? You know, so many people feel as if, you know, to find God, uh, you know, they've got to go into some building, they've got to kind of become somebody, you know, kind of uh, unusually pious or whatever it might be. The reality is, sometimes Christians forget that all they are is saved sinners. Right? You know I mean, you know, I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's all I am, right? And sometimes people say to me, John, I'd love to come to your church, but it'll fall down. And I say to them, look, mate, I've been there 20 years, it's never fell down. Trust me, it would have done if it was based on who we are. But we don't have to become religious. Natural fact, Jesus uh, was forever, uh, you know, sort of exposing the hypocrisy of those who were religious. The very disciples who were praying Sovereign Lord were praying against the hypocrisy of those who were religious and who were trying them and saying you stop preaching the gospel <laughs> but these are lies of our society but the lies that any of us you know, can buy into now for Christian we've got to understand those lies because we've got to bring the hope of the gospel the message of the gospel the good news of the gospel against all of that if we're not yet decided for Christ we need to understand that sometimes maybe what we've been doing is buying lies that will not deliver us what we actually long for which is that eternity with God. And so they're praying for a boldness that they could just speak the words of promise into that context and that God would do great things. Well, your beautiful thing is, uh, it, it tells us there uh, that when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? God actually visited them uh, in a very powerful way. Now, some people would look at that and just think it's the experience that I want, right? But in actual fact, that's not uh, that's not what God is saying. Uh, we're not, you know, but for for those folks there, God visited them a precious and powerful way. I, I've had the privilege of, of, of preaching uh, in the Isle of Lewis, where God visited in revival, and I've had the privilege of actually uh, standing outside the house where they did have this experience. Uh, where God visited in a powerful way and in actual fact the house shook such was the presence and power of God right? so it is something that the sovereign Lord of history uh, sometimes does from time to time but in actual fact what I think was going on here was that God in his love uh, for these men who were going to preach the good news of Jesus Christ with great boldness even although it could cost them their lives uh, there was a mighty move uh, of God by Spirit just to say you guys get up and go and speak the word with boldness and when you look at what happens in Acts chapter 4 that's exactly what they do they get up and they go out and they keep faithfully speaking the word of God they do it with great boldness and if you know anything of the history of the Christian church uh, the majority uh, of the uh, early disciples of Jesus Christ paid a martyr's death uh, you know for their beliefs uh, they, they sacrificed everything uh, for the sake of the good news of Jesus. Now we live uh, in a day and an age when very rarely uh, is that asked of us, certainly not in our context, but as I say in many contexts around the world, uh, it's still sometimes the result. What I want to do with a message like this, I want to encourage those of us who are believers that only the word of God, only the message of the gospel, only the seed of the word of God and the seed of the gospel sown in a person's heart and life is what God can take and use to bring a person to faith. One of the reasons why I'm passionate about the word one-to-one -one, and I love to sit down with uh, unbelieving friends and just read God's word with them. It's just such a beautiful way uh, to sit with dear friends who have not yet decided about Christ uh, and to walk them through what God's word says uh, and just to have a conversation with them and like see God working. I'm reading with three men at the present moment in time. Two have came to a living faith in Christ. The other is a retired mathematician. <laughs> he taught maths. <laughs> so here we are in a math class. 
Uh, and a few weeks back, he said to me, he said, you know, John, he, 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 he said, you know, I, I think I've never really been an atheist. This world is just too fabulous for that. Sovereign Lord of heaven and earth and sky, of sea. He said, but, he said, I think I'm agnostic on my way towards Jesus. That's a good place to be. That's a good place to be, right? Not a Christian yet, knows that. I'm agnostic on my way towards Jesus. And so what he's doing is he's just reading the word of God and reading it with a friend and we're just looking at who Jesus is. And he said to me the other day, he said, you know, I've realised God's, God's doing a lot in my life about sin. I'm realising that we're more of a sinner than we think we are. <laughs> That's God's word doing a work in a person's life. I'm more of a sinner than we think we are. That's what God does. He, he brings us to a place where we realise we're more of a sinner than we think we are. And when you start to realise you're more of a sinner than you think you are, you kind of realise I need a saviour for my sins. And I'm just praying that God will just bring him to that place where he crosses the line of faith. And so I want to encourage those of us who are Christians, we need to pray and cry out and realise we've got an incredible God. Get a vision of a great God. Get a vision of a God who is Lord over all of creation, Lord over all of the nations, Lord over all of history, and who is God of our moments right now. Right now. Get a vision of him and call out to him, speak to him. And ask that he might give you a boldness to share his word with others. To speak the good news of the gospel into others. Because that's the way God sows the seed of the gospel in the lives of those that don't yet know him. And what would I say to, to you know, folks that I know perhaps have never put their trust in Jesus Christ? God loves you. The word of God is for you. The message of the gospel is yours. God calls us to admit our sin, to confess our sin, and to put our trust in him. And only God can open the eyes to let us see him. And to put all our trust in him. And I'd encourage you, if God is doing that in your heart and life, then just to share that with someone you trust. Maybe even ask them, can we look at the word of God together? Can the word of God be powerful? What would I say? We're going to sing in a moment. Uh, you know, uh, Jenny's going to come just a moment or two and lead us. But uh, I was looking at the, the, the closing uh, hymn that we're going to sing, Yet not I, but Christ, uh, but through Christ in me. Look at the third verse. And maybe just when we stand and sing, maybe just focus on that third verse. Maybe just ask yourself, is that true for me? And if it's not true, there's a God who holds out the message of life to you and invites you to put your trust in him. Look what it says, no fate I dread. I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. Why? For Jesus bled. And suffered for my pardon. And he was raised. To overthrow the grave. To this I hold. My sin. Has been defeated. Jesus now. And ever is my plea. Oh the chains are released. I can sing. I am free. Yet not I. But through Christ. In me. That's who he wants to be. Christ in us. The hope of glory. That's who he wants to be. And so I, I, I pray that every one of us. Uh, can sing that from a saved heart. Uh, tonight. And I encourage you. Uh, you know just to, to belt that out. Uh, to the glory of God. Verse 23. When they were released. Sovereign Lord give us boldness. For you and I tonight. Let's sing out with boldness. Now, uh, you know, I am free. The chains are released. I can sing, I am free. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. I'm going to invite uh, the guys to come and lead us.